Aloha, and welcome to another edition of Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. It's only about 75 days until the upcoming general election, and this program has been dedicated to talking about some of the uh, issues, personalities, and just general uh attributes of the up, upcoming election. And we have with us Hawaii's favorite pundits, uh, starting with, uh, first of all, Chad Blair, and um, who is actually up there right now at the Democratic Party convention. So we are, you know, we are taking advantage of his, uh, whoever sent you there, <laughs> Thanks, Civil <Sybil> Beat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and obviously, we have from the University of Hawaii, Colin Moore. And uh, welcome, Colin. I'm, 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 I'm one of the things I'm going to be interested in is how excited your students are getting about the upcoming election. We'll we'll get to that. And of course, we have with us Jay Fidel the heart and soul of Think Tech Hawaii. So let's go for it, guys. Uh, exciting convention. You know, I I, I got to tell you, you know, uh, two months ago or when we had the Democratic State Convention and they were looking for people to run as a, uh, as delegates to this convention, I, I, I just, I passed. You know, I said, yeah, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm not going to be like Bill Clinton and go for it to every convention as long as I'm alive, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, the events of the recent past start, uh, happened where Joe Biden dropped out, Camilla got in, she appointed. I mean, all the things that are happening. And guess what, folks? I wish I was a delegate. So I'm going to start <laughs> with Chad. Chad, tell us. From your uh, perch, how's the convention going? Well, let me first of all say, Governor, I'm glad it's day four. <laughs> because <laughs> after Stevie Wonder and John Legend last night, Tim Walls and all the football players, uh, and to say nothing of Michelle Obama on Tuesday night and, and uh, President Biden, Hillary, blah, 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 blah. Uh, by the way, I'm at the McCormick Place Convention Center and it's 3 p.m. Uh, Chicago time. After we're pal, I'll be catching a shuttle to the United Center where the Chicago Bulls play and program starts around 5.15. And there's talk about some superstar performances tonight. But, you know, I've only gone to one other convention. It was L.A. Uh, in 2000, Al Gore, Joe Lieberman, probably remembered most for that big kiss, right? Tipper and Al, <laughs> the everlasting kiss. But think about it. This is pre-internet, pre-social media, pre-everything. And I, I didn't end up finding a story until a couple of days later after I caught a plane back. I was working for Honolulu Weekly, right? The alternative weekly, weekly newspaper. There's another <laughs> data thing. I, 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 I'll have to admit, I, I am stunned at how overwhelmed I have been by the experience how emotional, how historic, how honored I am to represent Civil Beat. And as what has turned out, like you said, Gov, two months ago, nobody wanted to go to the convention. It was the walking dead. Now everybody wants to go, and everyone that's here are all saying, we'll talk about this for the rest of our lives. Wow. So um, you've been looking at it, obviously, from uh, afar, Colin, and uh, what's your impressions? I mean, it. I wish I was there. That's my impression. Um, I mean, it just seems to be joyful and exciting. The Democrats seem to have found their uh, found their groove in a way that's been missing for you know ever since I think the Obama convention. Um, and there seems to be just a, a return to some of the party's core values. I think a. a, a it just seems like this celebratory atmosphere that I can't remember in American politics for, for years and years. Um, and I think that every night there's been some, some amazing speeches. I mean, uh, amazing appearances, the sort of moments that you know are going to be repeated again and again and again on social media. I mean, it does seem like you know, even and Jay, I mean, Chad probably has a better sense of this than me, that some of these speeches and some of these moments at the convention seem almost manufactured, that they know people are going to clip them. In fact, I think that's what the uh, uh, 
Governor Wall said last night, you know, this is the moment to, to clip my speech and send it to your undecided friends, that there's all of these moments that seem just ready made to be sent out as a, as a TikTok or, or put on Instagram. So it's a different way, I think, of even consuming the convention than I have in the past. And some people seem to be better at it than others, but even, you know, even veterans of conventions like Bill Clinton, you know, he had a few moments there that, you know, uh, someone told him, you know, get, get in a few of these clips that, that we'll be able to reproduce. And um, what was it he said about Trump that um, it's, uh, uh, it's about the eyes or now I'm forgetting the, the exact. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Don't count the lies, count the yeah, eyes. Don't count the lies, count the eyes. Exactly. That was a, That was a great line. I may just add one thing. I don't know what went across the TV because obviously I'm there. And even though we've got the big screen, you know, we can see the stage and we can see Clinton and you know, he was, he wasn't using a teleprompter, right? You know that he was actually yeah. using a printed speech. And they say that because of that, and if this is old news, I apologize, he didn't know when to get off the stage. I mean, it's not nothing. <laughs> he was feeding off that crowd. He loved it. I mean, talk about an old school governor. I think he said it was 1972. Was that McGovern? For that? <laughs> no, when he was governor. When he was governor of I Arkansas. I think his first convention, though, was 1972. I think he was working for yeah. the Georgia McGovern campaign. But anyway, I agree with Colin. Jay, what you know what uh, what is interesting about this convention is that as I was watching it, uh, it seemed to resemble um, Ronald Reagan's convention. A lot of patri patriotism, a lot of America is great, and a, a lot of... Uh, USA and and all of that. I, what was your impression of uh, from from your perspective? Uh, I don't think we ever had a convention quite like this. Just look at the uh, the crowd, incredible, and um, look at the technology. You know, uh, not not all the speakers, but a lot of them had their text up on the screen. So if you were in that huge crowd, you could see the words, you could see what was on their teleprompter. That was re remarkable. And then think of those huge big screens and, and think of you know all the tele, I mean, there had to be 80 million people watching this. And in our house, it was on all the time. And I say to myself, um, you know, uh, in many American households, including Republican households, it was probably on all the time. Once you saw Somebody like Michelle Obama, God, she was fantastic. I hate to say this, she might have been better than Barack. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry to say that, but I think she was fabulous. Yeah. Um, Tim Walsh was absolutely fabulous. Um, Pete Buttigieg also, he, Buttigieg is just great. And Kamala today, I, that's why I envy you, Chad, because you're going to see that real time. Don't you think that there was a little bit more patriotism in this convention? Absolutely. A little more fun, too. This was really fun. This oh, was yeah. a bubble of fun, a great image, great entertainment. You remember Chautauquas in the 19th century where they came from all around and they met and re-met their friends and associates? Uh, the American concept of Chautauqua, that's what we had here. That's what we have, a festival, a celebration. I think it galvanized the Democrats uh, I think it probably had a huge effect on the down ballot, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about that, Chad and Colin. Um, and I expect there'll be a big jump in the polls. How could there not be? Everybody was watching, and it was great to watch. That's my reaction, John. Well, okay, uh, Chad, react to Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I mean, the joy extends directly from Kamala Harris, and everybody is drink the Kool-Aid, if you will, and they like it. It tastes very, very good, and uh, and it's real. It's not fake. It is not manufactured. There's something going on in that room that that center, which is huge, is so enormous. And by the way, sometimes I'm in the nosebleed section. Sometimes I'm in the on-a-side media. I like to float around and get a feel. I went down to the floor for a brief while and visited with a wide delegation and whatnot. But in terms of this patriotism that you get to, one of the things that has come across is the Democratic Party is trying to reclaim what it means to be an American, to take it back from Trump and this idea that somehow they're the only true party that really cares about their country. And that theme came off again and again and again 
uh, that we serve in the military, that we we work at McDonald's. That line about was it Clinton working? I don't want to talk all about Clinton, but Kamala and, and Bill Clinton working at McDonald's. He did mention that Trump eats McDonald's all the time, but that's another thing altogether. <laughs> but they are reclaiming and owning the narrative, and you can see the Trump people just flailing. They are not prepared for this. They wanted Biden. They wanted. A guy that was flailing, having troubles keeping it together, and they've got the complete opposite. And they've got two white guys that can't seem to get beyond their base versus this highly diversified coalescing party. And what was the reaction on the floor when, when the, with the surprise appearance of Oprah, Chad? That oh. was that was amazing on television. I just thought this they can't do any better. And then Oprah shows up. So we get the list. We, we have, as part of the media, the Democratic National Party's uh, a list. So we know who the guests are going to be uh, an hour or two beforehand. They don't always follow it, but it's pretty precise. James Taylor, for example, maybe you heard. He was supposed to play Monday night. He got caught. It was too long. Oprah was not on that schedule. And it was astonishing. I mean, of course, she's Chicago. She's from there. But I'm thinking she's probably up in upcountry right now. So <laughs> you, know? Well, you know what is interesting? She's the only person that mentioned Hawaii. She did. And she mentioned it, if I understood correctly, as part of all the other places where she has a home, or maybe what she said yeah, was yeah. where she has lived, right? And that was the only mention of Hawaii, although I think one of the governors, it might have been Westmore, I think he gave a shaka from the stage. Uh, yeah, I wonder yeah. if he was ever he stayed uh, in, in Oahu because he was in the military. But I think you're right, Gov, that was the only mention um, of Hawaii. And of course, that shows up on that that screen. Which was, she but, you know, great, personally was way. my, oh, oh, Oprah was. Well, Oprah which was my own. I didn't um, recognize Oprah at first. She looked she looked 20, 30 years uh, younger than she is. Um, she's in great shape. She lost weight. Uh when, when they first put her on in, in the hallway there, I said, hmm, who is this? <laughs> it's Oprah. <laughs> yeah, she was she, and, and well, I think though that the what uh, my tiny, tiny disappointment. With Barack was he didn't mention Hawaii, it's and true. and that's the one that might be a little show, uh, chauvinistic from my, my point of view, but uh, uh, geographically chauvinistic. And, and uh, but you know you kind of hoped they would have said playing basketball in Hawaii, you know, help me get the I, kind of. I agree marriage. with you. I was waiting for it as well because remember he mentioned his maternal grandmother. And, right, I thought that was the perfect place to do right, it. They grew up. Or he grew up right there, not far from Punahou. We all know where that apartment building is. It's still there. His grandfather, I believe, is buried at Punchbowl. But I think what he was trying to do was to make this connection uh, about a white woman from Kansas and, and his mother-in-law, of course, African-American, who had just passed away. And Chicago is where he cut his his political teeth. And that's where, where uh, Michelle is from. And so I, I guess I forgave him for that. But I, too, have been hungry for a little more... Hawaiianess, and of course, as a reporter from Civil Beat, all our reporting is focused heavily on what the Hawaii delegation is doing. But I, I share that sentiment. You had a very nice article this morning, Chad, in Civil Beat. That was very good. Uh, you reported to us from the floor, and we uh, we greatly appreciated that article from a whole Hawaii vantage point, is what it was. Yeah, thank you very much. The the delegation has been great. Gov knows this. Every morning they have breakfast. Although if you ask me, it's way too early. <laughs> We're not getting home. And they get home late at night and they wake up early and, they, and, and they everybody gets Those, caught up in this stuff. They do. All I can do is go back to my hotel and I'm literally right across the street from the Hyatt Regency Chicago. I'm at the Radisson Blue. I looked out. The Hawaii delegation is, is five minutes away. And that's great because I'm on the bus with them everywhere I go. And they've been so kind to invite us, me and another reporter, into, into their rooms. But some of those guys go out drinking. And they still drink. <laughs> I go back to the hotel. I take a hot shower and I have a cold beer and I get six or seven hours of sleep. For those guys, it's almost bragging rights about who gets the least amount of sleep. Everybody. <laughs> He's really, really tired right now, but um, <laughs> but that access has made stories like the one Jay cited, which is about you know what's Harris going to mean for Hawaii, which is basically continuity, Biden 2.0. But um, they've been very kind and trusting. Not an easy thing to do to let a reporter into your midst. They also gave me. I'm the photographer. They take an iPhone, take some pictures. So I do. I look tired. This is. I'm not faking this. <laughs> <laughs> What are you looking forward to today? 
Well, fortunately, from our standpoint, because Hawaii is five hours early, uh, my colleague Jessica Terrell and I, who spends part of the year here, um, are close to filing our stories. We file something around five, and that way I can go to the convention and more or less be interrupted because we're not reporting the national news. We're not, you know, that's everyone's watching that. Like Jay says, it's on the TV everywhere. That's not our audience. And then we tweak it as the night goes on. But we've already got a story that'll run tomorrow, essentially saying, what's, you know, what's the takeaway for the Hawaii delegation? And then we'll just top it off with tonight. But what I'm looking for in terms of a, a general picture, there is a lot of talk about who the, the big guest will be, who the the musical guests will be. And I've heard various names. Pink is one of them. There's all sorts of talk about Beyonce and, and Taylor Swift. Um, and, and so I, I'm very, very thrilled. At the same time, I think there's a sense of relief that it's over. It'll be over soon because people are exhausted. And the security, the amount of lines and time that you spend on the buses and going through the metal detectors is enormous. Everyone's been great, very cooperative, but it drains you. And um, I don't use one of those what are those things that record your mileage as you walk? What's that called? Pedometer. A number of people from the the, the delegation in Hawaii, like every day I'm walking 10 miles. <laughs> you know, of course, then you go out and have a drink at night. But um, so my message to everyone is drink water. You got to hydrate because you forget. But um, I think there's a, a desire to to wrap it up. It's it's such a good buzz. Each night has been has its highs and lows. I thought Monday was so strong. Michelle. I think gave the speech of the century on Tuesday. Last night was just pure fun. And then tonight, of course, it's all about Kamala. So um, oh, I guess one other thing I would say, Governor, is there has been a you know a concerted effort to try and have a prominent Palestinian protest. It's been a sort of hit and miss. And you've probably seen the news breaking now about uh, concerns about Gaza and, and so forth. I won't dwell on that, but that's that's another thing we've been tracking. But it seemed like the Palestinian protest was something that was anticipated, but kind of fizzled. There's 10 times, 20 times more police uh, than there are protesters, and they're cordoned off. They're far away uh, from the media. Uh, it's very hard to get to them. I did manage on the first night by the United Center, because it was so chaotic, to actually walk by a protest and take pictures of the flag flying and people saying genocide and, and, and whatever the case. And that's the closest I got to it. The last couple of nights, it's far away. It's it's a couple of blocks. And the security says, if you go down there, and they're behind a wall, they're behind a fence. The security says, well, if you go down there, you're going to have to come back and check in and go through the whole thing again if you want to get back inside the United Center. So tell whatever you say about Chicago, and maybe it was the lessons of 68, they know what they're doing. They are controlling this place tightly. And I think that has a lot to do. If you're a supporter of Palestine, it's it's suppression of free speech and whatnot. But if you're coming from Chicago's point of view and the Democratic Party, they don't want that to be the lead story. And it has not been. Yeah, it's a big difference. I was in Chicago in 1960. <laughs> it's a different Chicago, you know. You were there. I, I yeah, That's well, okay. I was there watching people get beaten up. You know, I was from Hawaii thinking, why are these guys acting so nuts? But the big news in 1968 was Danny Noy. Danny Noy got up and gave the speech that made the country fall in love with him. You know, But this time, I mean, this, uh, this time, Tim Walsh. I mean, you got to say there's got to be something uh, magical about all of us falling in love with middle America all over again, you know? I mean, who thought that could win elections? My generation came out of 68, went through uh, the Vietnam War, which left a distaste on everything. And the Democratic Party started to reflect a kind, not an anti-patriotic, a position, but more like a uh, let's not overdo it mm -hmm. type of position. In fact, in the 1988 convention in Atlanta, one of my, my communications director, Chuck Friedman, uh, used to take the opportunity to walk with the protesters around the building, you know, just to keep his uh, cred up. <laughs> it's like, it, it, like, it was a kind of different world. Of course, there was nothing as specific as Palestine and as uh, emotional. But, you know, it, 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 it was funny because uh, there were, for example, 
uh, uh, anti-geothermal protesters. So, you know, there was a kind of a Hawaii contingent. Oh, but so tell us, uh, Colin, what what does okay? What does the uh, well? Uh, you know, I really uh, was impressed by the coach. Actually, I was very impressed by the fact that um, Kamala took chose him. You know, and it was deliberate. So I had um, I had thought he would be a. a a great pick, um, you know, when he really started to get some media attention. And I mean, I think that there's clearly, they work together well personally. I understand that was important to her, but he delivers in an authentic way that I think some of the other potential vice presidents didn't do. I mean, I was noticing something about the speeches last night, which were universally great. But when you hear Buttigieg and you hear Josh Shapiro, who are certainly talented speakers, there's a there's a polish. There's a slickness. They sound a little bit like Obama. Tim Walls, I mean, Coach Walls, he just sounds authentic. He, he is. The speech was great. But I mean, if this were a forensics competition, you probably wouldn't judge him as the number one speaker. But it was authentic. Um, you know, his family's reaction was authentic. I mean, even the hokey bit where they got all those middle aged guys up in their old high school football uniforms that worked. It worked. <laughs> Um, you know, and I think that he is projecting a sense that, um, you know, and, and I, I think this is an effort to speak directly to a lot of American men. I mean, we haven't talked about this yet, but what we're seeing in the polling is we this is a bigger gender divide than we've ever seen. I think that's right, Chad, or certainly up there um, in, in people's voting preferences. And I think they I think Walls is an effort to not only speak to the Midwest, but I think to speak to people who at least identify as, as Midwestern dads. I mean, that they the Democrats are welcoming everyone, including if you're a football loving guy who, you know, likes to drink a couple of beers and, and mow your lawn. Um, I think that is a message that Walls is, is sending um, and his style of speaking is projecting his football metaphors. You know, that they're trying to fight in a way that I haven't seen them address in a long time uh, that the Democratic Party is a big tent and that tent also includes people who think of themselves as more traditional family men. Um, and those rhetorical um, talking points, I don't think have been present in a lot of democratic conventions. Um, you know, they even gave this, he even had that line about, you know, no one from my graduating class went to Yale. Of course, basically <laughs> everyone who preceded him on that rostrum had gone to Harvard, <laughs> Yale or something like that. Um, but um, you know, I don't remember where Tim Waltz even went to college now, uh, Minnesota. Uh, teachers college or something, but this, you know, this state you're trying to connect. You know, what's great line was that I, 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 I can shoot better than the, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the, con in the Congress, you know, all these guys. And he tied that together uh, very well. I think he handled the second amendment issue in, in a way that I believe most Americans, including those that like uh, to shoot, believe ought to be done. I mean, we need safety. So, Jay, any any thoughts, any uh, anything about uh, the vice president? Well, my favorite my favorite remarks. Uh, let me let me go to my favorite remarks. Then the vice president. Uh, my favorite remarks uh, were from uh, Michelle Obama, and of those, when she started talking about black jobs. <laughs> for oh, herself wow. and her husband. That was such a knockout. And it was just out of the park on that one. But a lot of them had out of the park, and, and he certainly did. Go ahead, Colin. I was just going to say, maybe we could ask you a question, since I think you're the only yeah, one. No, go I'm ahead. I, you know, I'm, I, I thought today's show would be more conversational than yeah. the usual moderation. So, yeah, everybody jump in whenever you uh, – we're, we're just having a conversation. You've given some big speeches like this. And I mean, I think everyone agrees you're a pretty talented speaker yourself. How do you, I mean, how do you think about developing those big rally speeches? Actually, I did address the convention, uh, especially, and was one of the nominating speeches with uh, leading up to Bill Clinton's uh, nomination. And I got to tell you, it is a trip. First of all, nobody, 
nobody gets on that stage that that doesn't go through coaching. I mean, they you if you're not, most people think that they know how to read a teleprompter. But what is, well, you can tell somebody who is very good at it when their eyes don't only stay on the teleprompter, but actually look at the audience. And that's something that they spend some time coaching with you. The second thing is, unless you are a Michelle Obama or a Tim Walsh or anybody else, most of the, the when you're up on the stage, uh, when uh, speaking, people are walking around. Not, you know, there's like 20,000 or whatever thousand people out there. It's the biggest crowd you ever address. And not all of them care about what you're saying, except when you give the right lines and everybody will, will, will jump up and down, And uh, except your state, of course. So, you know, they usually try to bring the person's state up a little bit closer so, you know, they can be all cheering. And, but what happened with Tim Walls, where they stayed for like, I don't know, hours after, is more than normal. I mean, you know, it, it, it was it, these guys, at least that delegation obviously loves this guy. And, and they were going, they would walk through a wall for him last night. And, and, and so, you know, it, it brings energy when that happens. One of the differences, though, I haven't been to as many conventions, obviously, as Clinton, but I, I have a, been to quite a few. And this convention is the first convention, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, where there wasn't a dissident, there isn't a dissident Democratic faction. I'm just going to jump in there. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy in 1980. Um, I mean, even with Al Gore, he had a he had a Bill Bradley give him yeah. a run. It didn't work out too well, but there was there was that as well. And uh, Jesse you know, Jackson, Jesse Jackson, who I saw uh, in person uh, during was it the time? I, what what year was? When did Jack 88? Is that sound right? Yeah, well, he did that. He ran against Dukakis and Clinton. Yeah, eighty-eight and ninety-two, right? So, uh, yeah, and, um, I think I saw him in the eighty-eight, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in an airport hangar, and he was electrifying. And I think the Time Magazine at the time had a picture, and it just was the word Jesse question mark. You know? Yeah, I was sitting at this big donor's lunch, and Jesse was next door in a different auditorium. In, uh, you know, and I, I told my staff that, look, you guys stay and control our table, and. I, I'm going to go listen to Jesse because he's much more exciting. You know? I want to say one other thing, too, about not having any dissidents. I'll tell you this. About 100 of those people that have spoken so far have, will be running for president someday. I'm exaggerating, but I can, do not remember a deeper bench ever in the Democratic Party where you could easily pick out 20, 25 people, black, white, brown, red, yellow, male, female, whatever the case may be, gay, straight, and, and any one of them could be a legitimate contender. So if Harris makes it in, ends up serving eight years, I don't think Walls will be running for uh, president eight years from now. But what a what a league to, to fall back on. Compare that to Trump, where he has either driven out some of the more promising uh, members of his party, or they've totally signed on to his his agenda. And if he loses, of course, that agenda, that losing agenda sticks to them. So I can't remember the last time there was such a talented field of Democrats. Well, it's not only talented. It's the choice of words, the choice of issues, the coaching, as John says, the teleprompter and the way to read the teleprompter. And I, and I, saw, um, I saw fragments of what FDR taught us about public speaking. You know, you, you you use repetition, you use pauses, you wait for people to applaud, you time your remarks, uh, use short phrases. I mean, they were all Akamai about these things. I mean, the really good ones were more Akamai about it. So I, mean, I agree that there was a bench there that will yield us more presidential material going forward, which is good. Um, but it's also a matter of the speech. Some of them we hadn't seen very much before, and now they become heroes 
because of, you know, 10 or 20 minutes on the podium. We will never forget them for that. Well, that happens at these conventions. I mean, that's kind of a moment for for people to step up. You know, it did. It happened with. Um, well, look at Ann Richards, and the John and the George Bush thing, where you know he's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, you know, th- these lines. Uh, uh, Bush, Barack or, Obama Obama was two thousand eight. Yeah. yeah, he was a a senator for only two years, and all of a sudden he's running for president of the United States based on a speech. Clinton almost didn't get elected. Uh, uh, dominated based on a speech because he did the nominating speech for Michael Dukakis and took like an hour and a half. And everybody was basically walking out, you know. I, didn't, they, didn't they famously clap when he said, I'm almost done? Is yeah. That- <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, and I remember <laughs> because, <laughs> yay! And right after that, Ben Caetano and I were walking out of the convention, and Clinton came, and Hillary came by, past us. We said, "Oh!" And of course, we we said the you know the the required thing, which was a great speech, Governor. <laughs> what else are you going to say? And he looked at us and said, "You know, I didn't write that speech." You know. They gave it to me. They, the the caucus told me to cover everything that was in there. <laughs> but you know, and, and and so these things, you know, happen. That all these human elements. Uh, but this convention, this was the smoothest as a Democrat. It's a, it was almost. How do I put this? It was almost uh, like not us. <laughs> you know this. This is not, you know, it's not like usually, like, uh, what's his name? Um, Will Rogers used to say, you know, uh, I'm a Democrat. I don't belong to an organized party. That's what you expect at the Democratic Convention. The usual circular firing squad. Yeah, look, (laughs) you know, look at the time when Bernie Sanders was going up against the last uh, 2016 against Hillary Clinton. Yeah, no, well, that, was, that was a moment with the Hawaii delegation, right? Didn't right, remember. where uh, this young person flipped the bird at the thing, you know, and then told everybody she's going to vote socialist. I mean, that's that's how one reason why Trump Trump may have won. You got to give credit to the organizers. Who I, I don't know who they were. I maybe you met some of them, Chad. Maybe you met some of the speakers too. I I, I hope you had some access to anybody you wanted. Or you could find a way to talk to them and maybe interview them and so forth. But the oxygen was all there. Um, Everybody was organized. And my reaction, I hate to say this, was this was very expensive business. (laughs) Those those screens alone must have cost somebody a million dollars. The audio visual was out of this world. Uh, The choreography was out of this world, the way they played it, and the flexibility. They also demonstrated flexibility, leaving an open spot, for example, uh, for some speakers, and then and, and shoo them in at the last minute that way. Um, and it kept you wondering, didn't it? Well, what's going on here? Uh, what's, what will be next? And what will they say? Well, somebody organized it really, really well. Somebody is into entertainment, and to, to use a word I think you were looking for, John, this was theatrical. This was watchable from from the moment it started. And, and until what? Tonight, I guess it'll be theatrical and worth watching and everybody will watch it. Which brings me to a question I have for all of you guys. This was sucking the oxygen out of the media, sucking the oxygen out of American public attention and, if you will, global this is carried global, right? Um, global public attention. This had an effect on everybody. And if it was the same effect as it had on me, wow, it was a good effect. But question mark, what happens to Trump now? He must be feeling very poorly to have only negative attention and so little positive attention. No, none, no positive attention. Uh, he must be desperate. Well, I think two things. The first is, I mean, he heard him already complaining, especially after the Obama spoke on Tuesday night. They're picking on me. They're, you know, they're all this criticism and so forth. And you're like, geez, Donald Trump, you're the master of picking on people, uh, making 
he, he calls Harris dumb. And he, you know, I just, he, he's the guy who has professionalized the cruelty, the personal cruelty in politics. The second thing, and I think that thing that really drives him over the nuts, uh, over the head or over the cliff, I think is the better way to put it, is that the ratings, um, if I'm not mistaken, the numbers have been considerably larger than Milwaukee uh, for the RNC. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it, my understanding is that numbers size matters more to Donald Trump than anything. Crowd size, uh, ratings for TV shows, and that is his really main indicator of what's popular and what's not. And the numbers aren't lying. The poll numbers aside, because it's still mm -hmm. within the margin of error, and there will be a bounce. But those crowd sizes, he was already doing it before the DNC, they're real. And I think that's what will freak him out the most and send him to a whole nother level. And I don't, I don't know how he's going to respond to that. Uh, now I, he's going to do something. He's going to do something, and probably he is doing something. I think because there's two sides to Trump. You know, one is the insult side and the uh, remarks and the stupid remarks about policy. You know, I don't want to do anything quote intellectual end quote. Remember that one? Uh, um, but but I think he's working behind his back. He's got things going on like that legislation in Georgia, like voter suppression all over the country. He's got his acolytes working hard. While we enjoy the Democratic National Convention, he's got his people trying to screw up the result, uh, and I, and, and or maybe even have a kind of insurrection, whether it's a physical insurrection, in, insurrection or a legal insurrection. That's what he's into: cheating. And I imagine that despite the the lift that that the Democrats got are getting from this convention, Trump is a busy boy. And that's going to have an effect on the ultimate result because the ultimate result is not based on popular votes. True, but I it's think based also, on electoral votes. Okay, but I would say the Democrats are ready this time. They saw what happened last time. I mean, the election integrity stuff was already in place. The Democrats didn't quite believe it was coming. This time they know what's coming and they're already countering. Their lawyers are there as well. And I, I think they're prepared for what is already he's already laying the ground that it's a stolen election and that it I mean, he tried to float the idea that it's a coup, that it's unconstitutional, that's Harris. That has not stuck. That has not stayed. I don't think it has any legs to you. I, I haven't seen it. No. Democrats are prepared this time around. And remember, it didn't work four years ago. Trump lost over 60 lawsuits, including the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and um, and then, of course, he's still got the matter of those legal issues, which I think he still has his sentencing coming up in New York, doesn't he? Yeah, he yeah, still he does. Yeah. You know, yeah. the traditional the traditional way that, for example, that actually didn't happen necessarily with with Hillary, but that the traditional Democratic way of a convention would be there's always this dissident group somehow that uh, before Thursday night, People make peace, and then everybody comes together, and hopefully we can stick together during the election. This time, AOC is giving a speech. The progressives, the, I, I was, I was uh, impressed actually by the fact that the left wing of the Democratic Party fell so convincingly into the folds, into the tent, came right into the tent, up front, uh, with the Tim Walls. You know, uh, uh, this, is, this is a new a new party, a new dimension. I agree with you, Governor. I mean, and if we just focus um, on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I mean, she has shown herself to be a very pragmatic political actor um, recently. She... I mean, the progressives were the ones who were defending Biden originally and trying to make sure he didn't drop out. I was really struck by that. But then they have, um, you know, they have embraced Harris quickly. They haven't really played to, I mean, it's certainly some of the progressives who have been critical, who have been um, sponsoring the Gaza protests, but they have been right up there front and center supporting Harris. They haven't been giving any oxygen uh, to the dissident factions. So it's a, the, 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 she in particular, but I think a lot of the progressives are are see this as uh, as a moment when they have to be entirely unified. And you know, I, I don't think anyone will ever be able to quite explain how this came together so quickly. I mean, I think that this 
something shifted in the air. That is not an official political science explanation. And, and the number of Republicans, the number of Republicans who are speaking out against Trump, mm-hmm. public. I mean, this whole line, if you vote for Harris, you know, you're not a Democrat, you are a patriot. Mm-hmm. You are an American. You are an American. You are an American, you know, and, and this is this is something. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question now is, okay, that's great, and the, this campaign will have its own life for the presidential seat. What, what's going to happen, or what do you think will happen to the down ticket? I, I mean, the no, conventional wisdom would be the better, the stronger the campaign for the president is, the better it is for the down ticket. Um, how many people that would vote against Trump would also vote uh, for a Democratic candidate for the Senate? I don't think it'd be perfect, but it will have an effect. It'll have an effect on the down the down uh, ballots. You are hearing talk around the convention about the trifecta, uh, winning not only the White House and keeping the Senate, but also picking up the House. That's enormous. I don't know if it's going to happen, but you hear a lot of people talking about it. I hear talk from people from the Alaska delegation, which is a red state, saying it's only a matter of time that state's going to slip. Slip, rather. In fact, the Alaska delegation, as Governor knows, is close to the Hawaii delegation, 49th, 50th state. Utah delegation. Hawaii's delegation has had breakfast with Utah. And that state, too, the Democrats predict, is starting to turn from red to pink and maybe purple. Remember, Mitt Romney's from that state, he, right? He was the nominee. And, and of course, he was one of the few Republicans in the Senate to impeach Trump. And you're hearing people talk. I heard one fellow today say Mississippi. <laughs> Mississippi. <laughs> well, Mississippi had a Republican governor when Clinton ran. That's true. Ray but Davis. Also and in fact, the entire Clinton. South. Yeah, but it's also a largely black state, and blacks historically have been part of the uh, the Democratic tent. But um, but you're seeing people thinking maybe this is going to go beyond just getting Harris in there. That this might be a something more long term, which is just not the history of elections. But as Colin knows this. There are cycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah but there's also know. leadership, and uh, you know she is a leader. Uh, she has she has led this focus. Um, and we see the Democratic Party focusing on certain issues. Uh, I think she's at the point of that. And I think uh, that we will see her do that in her talk today. She'll well, be um, echoing all of the um, platform points and more, but all of the, the concepts of family and liberty and freedom uh, that we've heard in the other speakers. And I, I, I give her a lot of credit. It's not just the organizers. It's her. When she gets up there and does her joyous warrior thing, uh, people follow that. And I think that's got to be part of the mystery that Colin talked about. How, how did this happen? What's going on here? Well, I think, part of it is I think, just her. It is, but it is, but not just the joy. I mean, the New York Times and others reported that what happened was Harris got on the phone and 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 rallied and got those delegates all 4,400 or so of them, or a good many of them, within a day or two. I mean, the Sunday after Biden, wasn't it a Saturday night, the yeah. Biden's uh, announcement or, uh, through a statement, not even going live on TV, right? That's the era we live in. She got on the phone. She had a group there at the uh, Naval Observatory where the VP lives in D.C., and they they worked the heck out of it. And, and that's a side of her, a skill oh. that is not immediately obvious. I mean, it's Remember, Harris's reputation for the last three and a half years nationally has not been a good one. She has been seen as uh, inexperienced, is not handling certain issues like border control very well. Part of that is probably sexism and racism in the media. I think there's certainly something to that. But this is stuff about Kamala Harris we didn't see. And uh, and it's it's her skill set that seems to be a critical difference in making the change here. Well, you know, from a political pers- perspective was... For three and a half years, she she was actually a sort of underground organizing. I mean, that's the feedback you get. In other words, you know, when she when she went to Chicago, she may not have gotten media coverage, but when she was in uh, Helena, I don't know if she ever went to, but let's say Salt Lake City or some other state, 
she being a uh, vice president drew crowds. Right. And she got a lot of local publicity. And apparently my feedback from people was that she spent a, a lot of time getting to know these grassroots candidates. So. I can't tell you how many people here at the convention, when I go to the caucuses and various speeches, they know her. I mean, they actually have a personal relationship with her. People that you've never heard of, powerful people as well, but they know her. And that goes right to the Hawaii delegation as well. They call her Kamala. They don't call her Vice President Harris. They call her Kamala. So well, and we they, all call her Kamala, and we all know how to pronounce it. Yeah, and, and it's the coach. They call Tim the coach, coach right? The coach. Well, I, the I thought coach. not governor, but coach. <laughs> but, you know, there's a certain strategic advantage. And if I was Trump, I would be screaming about this. I'm sure There's he... a certain strategic advantage of, of uh, somebody coming in at the last minute mm -hmm. when people have been focusing on you for years mm -hmm. and know all your wants, everything that you've done. And all of a sudden, people come rushing in, and you don't know that much about it. You don't have them. You don't You don't know. And, and here they are, running. So let and, me... Uh, let me... Let me ask you guys a question about what you think we're going to hear tonight, because one of the criticisms I've heard, and I think there's some, it's partially fair, is that so far this campaign has been really light on policy details. We haven't heard the big economic speech. I mean, there's been a couple of uh, a couple of suggestions, but I mean, at least if you compare this to when Hillary Clinton ran and there were like phone books full of policy briefs, it, it's, she, is she doing this? I mean, I think she's doing this strategically, which is that She's going to sort of ride this vibes election as long as she as long as she can. But do you expect, or is it even necessary? Do you think for her to roll out the usual sort of economic policy, more detailed policy packages um, in the next month or so? My answer would be no. People do not expect that. Um, they love what what she's selling right now. They love the notion of freedom and diversity. Uh, they love the notion of a better a better time in America. To the weeds on it, I think there's a certain risk in that. Yeah, I think, like I said, this is the Reaganite convention. How? Okay, real quickly, how how much uh, impact you think this will have on, uh, let's say, West Oahu? West Oahu, you mean the more conservative area? Not necessarily conservative, you know, but they in the last election, there was this resurgence of. Yeah, uh, we talked about this before, and that's why to the question about down ballot, I, I don't know how much goes down to the state legislature uh, or the council, um, but um, that's a that's a good question. I, you know what? Now that I think about it, I mean, if you asked me this a month ago, I would have said it wouldn't made any difference. But Joe Biden was leading the ticket a month ago. And now when I think uh, a race like with Elijah Perrick, who's going up against Corey Rosenley for yeah. a state house seat, I can see this making actually a, a big difference because um, it has electrified and energized. And another thing about 75 days to go, that ain't much time. I mean, that's it's two and, and a half months. Yeah, and all they got to do is get up there and go, joy. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Well, joy. Part, of, part of West Oahu is the military. It is. It's and and uh, this this convention has really seen a lot of commentary about the military and about how Trump treats the military. And if they weren't aware of Trump's strange sensibilities on the military, they're more aware of it now. And hopefully those conservative members of the military will. will the problem is, though, the military vote in their own states for the most part. Right. And, uh, you know, and so how much impact the military will, will had and will have on the local races? I'm gonna... to, Jay's, to Jay's point, I think picking uh, Walls, who is 24 year veteran. Oh, yeah, that, that was good. Strategically, it was a good thing. Having people like Wes Moore, who served in Afghanistan, Maryland governor, or Tammy Duckworth, who has her own ties here, wounded in Iraq. More yeah, than... Conrad Bur Bones first, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, corporal. Which, uh, which tells me we got. Sports. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question to all of you, and that is the media. 
Okay, mm -hmm. the media was doing 27, 24 by 7 on this, and it was applying a huge amount of resources to it. For a lot of this convention, there were no ads. Uh, to my observation, the ads only started like yesterday, but Monday and Tuesday, no ads. And they were really bringing their best talent to do analysis and commentary. That really was something. And one thing is that they had the cameras uh, focusing on people in that huge crowd close up their face shots okay and you could see from those shots the diversity you could see everybody all there all diverse and that was a statement it was a statement by the media so the question i i, I put to you guys is um did the media do a good job on this because you know the number of issues actually uh were the issues defined by the campaign but they did not follow some of the issues taking place in the world today. Uh, they did not talk about, to my observation, much about Ukraine or about Sweden's move to help Ukraine. They didn't talk about Modi going to Ukraine like tomorrow. Uh, they didn't talk about the talks, and talk a lot about the protesters. Well, some something, as you say, Chad, something about the protesters, but they didn't talk about the peace talks and the possibility of a of a wider war. I mean, the, the real issues on the ground outside the U.S. It was limited to those specific focus issues that are in her campaign. Now, query whether that was right or wrong, but that's what the media did. Thoughts? I'll be quick on this because I know we don't have much time, but the media, the news media, the televised news media, the broadcast media and social media is increasingly about entertainment. And I think that is what you're seeing. And that's what the Harris campaign, the DNC have capitalized on. Modi? Who's Modi? What's a Modi, right? Oh, yeah, the leader of the largest country in the world, the largest democracy. No, this is about selling a product and the and the media latching on to it. Colin? I, I agree with I agree with Chad. I mean, this is this is what people want to consume right now. It's always been a little difficult to sneak in those hard news stories about international news. But um, I think the new media model, I mean, when they have a winner, something people are actually consuming and watching like the DNC, they're going to give you more of it. Well, uh, let's have some fun for the last few minutes. Uh, best lines, best lines from any speaker. Days right. It was, it was it was Michelle and black jobs are in the White House. I was in that center and there was a rumble like you never felt before it was astonishing i mean it was a physical rumble not an audio one it was there but the whole and i was and i was definitely in the nose speech section that went to a whole that one will be the biggest line i believe uh, out of this uh convention although we still have one more night to go <laughs> colin I mean, any favorite oh, i got one in that wasn't a line it was a gesture but but, but yeah yeah <laughs> Can't believe he got away with that, but that certainly is memorable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know the fact that yeah, I, I don't how of all people. I know exactly <laughs> the last person you would expect that from. You know the most tight, tied person <laughs> ever. A anything you got, uh, Jay? Yeah, well, I know I agree. I, I I stand by my earlier comment about black jobs with Michelle Obama, but I thought that Tim Walz's uh, closing was really fabulous, and it did remind me of FDR. Um, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something like uh, he he stated the first part of the poem and waited for the audience to come back with the second part. Remember what he said? And that was his closing. It was fabulous. It got them all on their feet. And uh, he's a he's a great orator. What did he say at the beginning? I never give little speeches. I never give big speeches like this. I only give locker room talks, pep <laughs> talks, he said. Pep and that's talk. what it was. It was a pep talk. So, oh. I mean, he was amazing. And he reached a lot of people. So just real quick, we got your, your, your uh, favorite um, person that you think may be running for president someday. So Chad, you're you're there running around. That's a good question. I, I I I can't narrow it down to even ten. There were that many. I will say this: there's too many of them, like Josh Shapiro, that sound too much like Barack Obama. Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah. The, the guy I think people will remember who they probably hadn't seen before is Wes Moore from Maryland. Yep, he was good. Good choice. Jay, anybody? Well, I think the next person who runs for president is going to be Kam Kam Kamala. Uh, she's she's going to run a second time. 
And a lot will happen, like uh, Brian Schatz said last time, a lot will happen, a lot of surprises, a lot of changes. But the concept is right. It's from the people who spoke at this convention. We will select the next president. That's yeah. what's happened before, and it's likely to happen again. Um, and it, I can't say who it might be, but I will say it will be somebody we know. <laughs> somebody who we saw this week. Yeah, yes. so they, so there, there's obviously a, a deep bench there, you know, uh, uh, and and there were people running around. Um, we talked, uh, you know, the feeling uh, of this convention, Chad, again, I, I got to really pick on you, but, you know, it, it's obvious that there were a lot of really good political strategists, technicians in charge. But it seems to be more than that. I mean... I, I've never seen a group of people so anxious to get to work, at least visually. It's authentic. It's a united front. They are not faking it. You can just feel it in the air. You can feel it on the shuttle buses back and forth, the media and the delegates. You can feel it in the hotels, the convention center. Um, there's a part, history is happening right now. Well, I tell you what, that's a great line to close yeah. on. Oh, and we want to thank you, Chad, for, uh, you know, coming in and, and sharing with us your experience. I know I, know I speak for uh, Colin and for Jay to tell you that we wish we we were there with you, you know, and helping you uh, at least drink a beer. But oh, yeah. I got two cold ones, tall boys, waiting in my room tonight, and I don't have to fight back until... I get to sleep in tomorrow morning for the first time as well. And boy, do I need it. I'm, I'm not feeling <laughs> this either. <laughs> I hope you're going to write a nice piece for soon in, in Civil Beat to wrap yeah. up on the whole the whole thing. Yeah, what well, I see at the convention by blood, chat blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank all of you for participating. We want to thank the people who are listening and tell you that this will be available for you to view uh, and uh, Jay, well, I guess you're going to put this somewhere, right? Uh, in, uh, in yeah, this will be on thinktechhawaii.com, and it'll be on uh, youtube.com/thinktechhawaii, and it'll be there later today. Thank you, thank you all, and we will see you again. We'll have another community matters coming up when we can be uh, even more analytical about where this election is going. Aloha. Okay, I'm not going to wear this, all right? I'm not <laughs> Yeah, it would be great to see you back like a normal person. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Take care, guys. Aloha. Aloha.